This is a story that starts with a pair of Game Boy games. The original Pokemon games caused a phenomenon unlike anything seen before or since. At the tail end of the 1990s, you couldn't escape it. Cards, clothes, CDs, Pokemon managed to seep into every facet of life. And out of this game series sprung an anime TV series. And from that sprung... a musical? Pokemon Live was supposed to be the next big thing for Pokemon. In adaptation of the hit TV series, this show toured the world and was even set to get a home video release of its own. But then, nothing. How does a piece of one of the world's largest media franchises tour the world and then basically become lost media? How did Pokemon Live fall into obscurity, and how did it get rediscovered? To answer all of those questions, we first have to understand the story of the creation of Pokemon Live. And that, perhaps, is a story that's best shown instead of told. More than a game. Anybody know how to play this, how to get to the next level? Or a top-rated TV show, Pokemon is an undeniable obsession with children across the country. Ooh, it's Pokemania everywhere, from Burger King to the king of internet retailing. If you guys don't know what Pokemon is, you are... <laughs> well, you're in need of some serious remedial toy education. And this is going to be one of the hottest selling toys for the holidays. This is a talking Pikachu from Hasbro Toys. Not even in the stores yet. It's going to be in next month. Pokemon, short for Pocket Monsters, was born four years ago as a Japanese video game. The star is Pikachu, who does lighthearted battle with 150 other characters in the number one TV show, the number one video game, and most of all in the popular trading cards. But what Pikachu and his pals do just as well is sell. They will earn over a billion dollars this year. And the Pokemon is creating a monster of a commotion for American kids. That's all they're wanting now is pure Pokemon. We haven't sold any yo-yos or Star Wars merchandise in a long time. Almost every Japanese child knows Pocket Monsters and its star, Pakucho. They play the Nintendo computer game. They even sing the Pocket Monsters song. Pokemon! This is the main character right here. He's called Ash Ketchum. And I'm, again, it doesn't make any difference what I say, it's what their own material says. I'm going to tell you what, what they describe him as. Listen to this. An energetic and determined 10-year-old who's a little too competitive, and he's obsessed with catching all Pokemon and driven to become the world's foremost Pokemon master. And here's Brock over here in the corner, and Brock is by far the most hormonal because his fascination with the opposite sex many times gets him or the group in trouble. This started, you said, as a, as a video game, right? As a video game from Nintendo and Pocket Monster Pokemon about three years ago, and last year it was brought to television in the United States as an animated series on Saturday mornings. And with that comes all of the merchandise, as you know, and with that came this game the trading this, cards, these trading right? cards now did, the kids are playing with these i'm wondering how many parents are buying these at six eight dollars a pop and shoving them in the drawer or putting them in the plastic cases to send their kids to college in 20 years this is the granddaddy of it all look at it we have got the neo promo psa gem min set we have got a set that nobody can get in the united states and we've got it graded this could be a twenty thousand dollar item and here's why every single solitary card is a gem mint the upcoming Pokemon the first movie recently caused such a frenzy that the switchboard at Warner Brothers was flooded with 70,000 calls a minute from people desperate for tickets. Here's the next character. This is Misty. And listen to what it says about her. She's headstrong and stubborn, constantly arguing with Ash. Typical woman. 
And then there are two characters, and one's called Jesse, and the other one's called James. It says, prepare for trouble, make it double. Jesse and James are an evil gang looking to steal rare Pokemon. Jesse and James are stuck up, fashion conscious, and you know what? In the program, they're also prone to cross-dressing. Time Warner, the parent of this network, is doing a full court press. Its Atlantic Records division puts out the soundtrack, its TV network carries the cartoon series, and its stores sell the goods. Pokemons and dads beware. Analysts say these cuddly monsters have staying power. They're still going strong after nearly four years in Japan. And Nintendo plans to roll out 100 new characters next fall. In 1999, Pokemon was at the top of the entertainment industry. Part of this popularity came from the Pokemon anime series, which was localized in North America by 4Kids Entertainment. Sometime in 1999, 4Kids CEO Norman Grossfeld sought out playwright Michael Slade with an idea. Um, I'm a playwright. I've written books to a lot of family theater musicals, and I... One day I was actually living in LA at the time and I got a phone call, a very mysterious phone call from people at Radio City Music Hall saying that I'd been recommended to them for a project and they couldn't tell me what the project was. They wanted to talk to me about time commitment and availability and would I be open to the possibility of a project that they couldn't tell me what it was. And then they called me a few days later and said, um, okay, it's, uh, we can tell you, but you, you know, you're sworn to secrecy what the project is. And it's, it would be a, a, music, a, a musical about Pokemon. And uh, what do you know about this? And doing my best, oh, I want to you know, get this gig thing. I said, oh, I know all about Pokemon. You know, Pikachu, all, yeah, of course. And, you know, the fact of the matter was, I, I, other than that word, uh, that was the extent of my Pokemon knowledge <laughs> at that point. Other than the vague knowledge that there was this series and that there was a movie that was out or that had come out, I guess. To help him prepare to write the script, Slade was sent a VHS tape of Pokemon the first movie for reference. He found it insane yet oddly charming and watched the movie through numerous times. And soon after, he was informed that the show was set to premiere in less than six months. When you're creating a big show, you usually have years. <laughs> and we were talking about months, and they, you know, we're sort of sitting there and they're talking and they said, well, okay, we're gonna, uh, we need to back up a little. So, so if we're gonna open that week, uh, we wanna do a week tryout somewhere. So back up a week from that. And, then, Louis, if you're the director choreographer and you're doing this, how long would you need to tech the show, uh, you know, which is the rehearsals where you're, after you've really rehearsed the show, but then you're putting all the technical stuff together and costumes and effects and everything. And he said, well, you know, probably 10 days to two weeks. And they said, okay, so we'll back that up another, you know, two weeks. And then they're turning to the design team and saying, well, now, when would the designs have to be to the various shops to be built in time, you know, to, to, for them to bid on it, to then build them in time to start rehearsals. And, you know, we got those dates and you know, we're sort of backing up so that we're sort of at like a week and a half from the day we're sitting there when I sort of you know, tentatively raised my hand and said, well, seeing as how none of this can happen until there's a script, at least a first draft of a script, when is it you're like looking to have my job done by? And the guy said, well, if you could have a rough draft of act one by a week from today, that would be really great. And, and, and a rough draft of act two by the next week, that would be perfect. Is that a problem? Pokemon's been number one in every medium that it's been introduced, so including the video games, number one video game of all time, number one kids television show around the world, 
number one movie that's been released. We know there's a demand out there for all types of entertainment related to Pokemon. And the one genre that we hadn't gone into yet that we always wanted to go into was a stage show. So this felt like the right time. My name is Jesse Nager. I played multiple roles in the ensemble, including Joe the Deaf Trainer. I'm Patrick Frankfurt, and I was Professor Oak in uh, Pokemon Live way back when. So I went to LaGuardia, the High School of Performing Arts in New York City, and, um, and in college I was getting my BFA in musical theater. Most of the people in the show had either just graduated or were fairly young and new to the scene and I was actually in college. I don't even remember why I went to the audition. I did, it was like my sophomore year. It was like the summer before my sophomore year. I went, I got it. And then I took a semester to <laughs> to, to tour with the show. Uh, my agent, uh, she said, hey, there's this show. Uh, I think you'd be good for it. And so I went to school for musical theater. Uh, and so she, got me the audition and I made it through all the cuts. I think it was like, I think I was the age group like right above Pokemon. So like, I think it was like people right, a little bit younger than me that were really into it. I do know that, I don't remember if this is what, how I learned about it, but Rachel Hoffman, the casting director, went to University of Michigan. At the time she was working for Dave Clemens casting and I knew her from Michigan because that's where I was going to school. So, I, but I don't remember how it all happened. And then I remember when she, when we, when I got it, she called me and she was like, are you going to take a semester after school to do this? And I was like, why not? 21, when I was like cast in Pokemon Live, I was like, I'm going to fucking regret this every day of my life. <laughs> but I was so poor. <laughs> That I was like, eh, fuck it. Because the, the time frame was so telescoped down so you know, so much from what you would normally do, there was a built-in energy and excitement of, oh my God, this is, you know, not only am I doing this, it's happening. And I'm as I'm writing, I'm we're seeing costume sketches and we're auditioning and we're you know, and, and it you know, it was really cool. And we wound up with we really wound up with, you know, incredible cast. You know, you had like Dominic and um, Lauren and who were like kind of, they had both just graduated from Boston Conservatory, kind of serious. And you had like Andrew and Patrick who were like, <laughs> who fucking cares? Like, <laughs> it's kind of a fun, a fun thing to do. I actually wanted to audition for the project because it, it looked really neat, you know? And the whole idea of playing these like action characters is just really fun. But you know, but people who, this was their first gig and Andrew Nels who, you know, was nominated for Tony for Book of Mormon and on Girls, he was just a uh, Jane. Dominic uh, Nolfi who, one of the stars of Jersey Boys. Honestly, it was a lot of our first big roles. Um, so no more of the, uh, you know, summer stock type, you know, things where we're rehearsing one day and then building the set the other day. Pikachu, Meow. I think those are the only two. We're, we're going to be played by little people in costumes. It'll be very exciting once we get in front of an audience to see exactly how the kids respond and stuff. One years old and I was like, I have no money. And like, it was Radio City and they're like, please do this thing. It's like, not please do this thing, like I auditioned. I was like an asshole, I was like, I'll do it. It wasn't, for me, it wasn't about Pokemon. It was about the people that were, you know, it was like Luis and Tony Galdi and like the people that were a part of it were really attractive to me, like working with them because they were such incredible people. Um, that was more exciting and the whole like Radio City thing. And then also just like, you know, being young, being able to make some money. Um, it paid really well from what I remember especially for, you know, an 18 year old still in college. You know, I did not have a Nintendo. I was not a gamer, so I didn't really know much about it. Um, but when I got the role, I learned more than I ever thought I needed to know. I know that like Dominic watched a bunch of the show, watched a bunch of the TV shows. I will journey to gain the wisdom of Pokemon training. And I hereby declare to the Pokemon of the world, I will be a Pokemon master. Uh, I just watched a lot of 
the cartoons, uh, basically, just trying to learn the characters. And, you know, as a Professor Oak, somebody who was supposed to be a, a Pokemon expert, and that was one thing they, they were like, it's not Pokemon, it's Pokemon. Do I remember a lot of it? No. But at the time, I was fairly, I got fairly well versed. The character was very over the top, maybe too much so. They were at Radio City, the rehearsals were at Radio City, and it was fun. I mean, they built it like a Broadway show, so, and and, and Luis was really like intent on telling the story and not, not letting the sort of uh, fantastical aspects get in the way of like, who these people were. And so he really attacked it like like any musical. There was a limit to how cool the effects could get, you know, and, and a significant limit to it. You know, it became more of, let's just focus the story on the, the human element of it. That we can do really well. This, you know, there's just, there's just limits as to what we can do. And rather than do it badly, let's pick and choose what we can, you know, let's pick and choose and, and do what we can do as, as well as we can do it. I think what stuck out to me was the fact that it was a good story. A good story with a, with a great cast. That's the one big thing because it, yeah, it seems kind of kooky that we're gonna do a musical like this. And it was primarily for kids, but they put a, a good story together. And so I think that was it. It's like the people who were involved in it didn't just say, oh, it's, it's this is just for kids. We're not gonna, we're not gonna worry about it too much. You know, everybody was, uh, you know, put great effort into it to make it as good as it could be. Contractually, there is a Japanese woman who does the voice of Pikachu. And as you know, Pikachu is voice is limited to the words Pikachu, Pika, and Chu. Pikachu. And but contractually, anytime Pika, anything is done with Pikachu, this woman is the one who must record the voices. She apparently also has or had some um, contractual approval of what and where in a script Pikachu said. And literally a few hours before the first performance in Albany, somebody returned from Japan having brought her a translation of the script to approve what Pikachu says and to record all of the Pikachu voice things. Andrew and Lauren were so, they, they were so much better than they had any right being. They it was they were so fucking funny in this show that like it it just made it real. Like they were just so good at what they what they did that it was they were just really really phenomenal. And at the time I was what I think I was like 22. Uh and most of us it was our first big show. Cuz it was non it was called a not it was a non equity show. Uh so it was not it was not union, so you know they couldn't. You're, you're not allowed to hire union actors for for that role. Uh, so so a lot of us were just starting out. We were so excited. I remember one first day of rehearsal, uh, one of the guys came in and just you know he's like he screamed, you know, we got jobs. I had I had like one of the big I want to say like Bulbasaur or Venusaur or something. I like. In the beginning, I, I like, it was like a car type of thing. I like drove out and shot somebody. The most com cumbersome costumes in that show had to be uh, the actual like Pokemon that were the people who were inside the Pokemon, like Pikachu, Meowth, uh, I think was it Psyduck, because we had to get fans for them because it would get so hot in there. Yeah. And then when they had to take that, take the like mask off their faces were beat red they really wanted it to be a good show not just a spectacle um, a lot of the dancers in the that's in like the closing i think they had the pokemon attached to them and they had to like do the dances where they're on like little rollers uh that was pretty intense i don't know if you'd call mecha mewtwo a uh, a costume per se but i was the guy in inside pushing <laughs> pushing that out <laughs> uh, and that was pretty heavy um, and then I mean we used the a lot of those 
props were made from the same people who did The Lion King. Uh, so you can also kind of see a couple of us in the back and we've got like little flying Pokemon uh, and those things didn't feel too good on their backs. I think most of it was puppets. Kind of when your kid shows, the actors are lip syncing the songs. Whereas in this particular show, everything is live. The singing, the speaking, the dialogue is all done as it's happening. So it really mirrors more in line with a traditional Broadway production than it does with a show that's designed specifically for children. Oh dear! As if it couldn't get any worse, the Pokemon are now getting their very own stage show! The musical Pokemon Live is showing in the U.S. on Broadway this September. Pokemon fans, book your flights now! 64 Magazine, Issue 42, July 2000. There was a Pokemon created for the show that wound up being cut from the show, but his power was Bubbles. He was really, really big. The thing arrived at Trenton when we were teching, and, and, and when we were teching, things, a lot of these things were sort of every day some more would arrive, and there was this big, big climactic battle, and well, this one was the one that was supposed to be the climax of the battle, the, the last one he battled, the biggest, most coolest, most amazing effect that we're gonna have on this thing. But it was huge, it was like, you know, 20 feet tall. It was, well, not 20, but probably 15 feet tall. It was operated by, I think, two people inside of it, one who was steering it around and one who was working the bubble mechanism thing. And it was supposed to be this huge battle between Ash and this bubble thing. And we get it on stage, and you know those toys that blow the little bubbles? Well, this, you know, 15-foot mega thing, his mouth opens, and that's what comes out of it. Opening night at, at Radio City, they had it out in the lobby. The, I think they put somewhere around, you know, millions, four million or something. Like, there was a lot of money backing this production. Uh, and there was a lot of talented people who went on to very, very, very successful, still successful, like uh, Broadway and, and acting careers. You know, it was, it's, it's a huge show. So it was long and tedious. The tech rehearsals were like really, really long um, just to get all the elements of everything together. The cast was so talented that it just, it was just a lot, you know, they just made the show really fun. It was really important in developing the story for me and, and for everybody involved was that we didn't want to just treat this like a kiddie show. We wanted to be able to talk to parents as well as to kids. It takes some actors decades to make it onto a Broadway stage. And out of the millions who attempted, only a select few ever set foot on NYC's prestigious Radio City Music Hall. It took Pikachu and his Pokemon gang a scant two years to get there. This is not a joke. Nintendo of America and Radio City Entertainment announced that Pokemon Live, a musical theater production, will start a nationwide tour beginning with shows at Radio City Music Hall from September 20th through October 1st. Gamers Republic Magazine, issue 27, August 2000. Radio City Entertainment for Kids Entertainment and Nintendo welcome you to Pokemon Live! Presented by eKidsInternet.com, the safe and secure private internet for kids. We'd like to thank our promotional sponsors, Kellogg's, Continuum Health Partners, and Mars 2112. At this time, please turn off all cell phones and pagers. Please note that the use of flash photography, video, and audio recording devices is strictly prohibited and that smoking is not permitted anywhere in the building. Please be aware that strobe lights and pyrotechnics are used during the performance. We hope you enjoy Radio City Music Hall and ask your help in maintaining its luster by disposing refreshment containers, candy wrappers, and chewing gum into the proper receptacles so that future audiences may share in this newly restored showplace of the nation. Thank you and enjoy Pokemon Live! It debuted in Albany, I think, 
and I think we did previews in Albany. We stayed at the Ramada and it was really ghetto and we called it the Ramdada. Like it wasn't, it was too ghetto to be called the Ramada. I actually met the creator of Pokemon at the opening. I know they were kept abreast of it. Uh, I think Four Kids Production had the rights to the American Pokemon and a couple other, you know, they worked closely with it, with the Japanese creators uh, because they also are the ones who did the cartoons here. I don't know how much veto power they had, but I know that there was a respect. And Four Kids really, they seem to have a goodly amount of autonomy regarding anything Pokemon here. Once the Nintendo and, and the, the international people signed off on, yes, we the script is fine, you know, we're fine with the script, we're fine with the designs, then they kind of seemed, as far as I could tell, to, to have fulfilled what they needed to do in terms of input. I remember, I, I wasn't a huge Pokemon fan. I am a big, like, video games, more like Marvel, X-Men person, and, um, they did, I remember they gave out Game Boys with the Pokemon game to all of the principals, but not the ensemble. But then I think Dominic was like, I don't want this. And he like gave it to me. You know, young guy, first big show, and they put so much into it. Uh, I made my New York debut in, in Radio City Music Hall. Then they had a big gala for the opening where they got, they all got like little, um, I think they were Volkswagen Bugs that had been decorated and made into like Pokemon, you know, like little Pikachu mobiles and stuff. Uh, so they each drove us up in front for the opening and we each kind of made our way down the way for for that big opening. After that, it was incredible. The, I think we sold out like, I think it was, what was it, two weeks? Two weeks of Radio City Music Hall. You know, it was for the kids, obviously, but they wanted to create something that the parents would also be able to tolerate. <laughs> so they, or my my feeling that it was intentional with Michael, that like they wrote a good show. <laughs> the Pokemon thing, you didn't have to do anything, right? It was like that was always going to be Pokemon. You didn't have to try to make that. So they really put a lot of the effort into the story, the music, the direction. Um, all that, all the musical stuff. Because the kids were gonna love the Pokemon stuff, whether the show was good or not. So they were like, well, why not also make a great show? I mean, Giovanni was the most, you know, for me was the most interesting character. I mean, just because the other ones are kids, you know? I mean, there's a limit to how complicated they can be. But I think I had one of the, you know, the coolest songs um, in there, which kind of was the, one of the, one of the themes of the show. Uh, which was, you know, Ash growing up, the kids growing up and having to, you know, to rescue the the parent figures, basically. Everything changes, changes. Like, I remember my mother came and was like, I didn't hate it. The musical went as follows. First off, a commercial introduction revealing our main antagonist, Team Rocket boss Giovanni, played by Darren Dunstan, who announces a new Pokemon badge that can be won in a battle against him, the Diamond Badge. This is preceded by the then-current opening theme from the Pokemon anime series. The first song is You and Me and Pokemon. This happens in the opening scene, after Ash's mom and Professor Oak go to a lecture on Pokemon sleep disorders together. Ash himself is woken up by his friends Brock and Misty, and he sings this song as a promise to make it up to Misty for forgetting her birthday. Meanwhile, at the Diamond Badge Gym, Team Rocket's Jesse, James, and Meowth report to their boss, Giovanni. Here, he shows off his greatest creation, a mechanical monster named Mecha Mewtwo. Based on Mewtwo, who was the main Pokemon featured late in the animated series' first season and the movie, Mecha Mewtwo's big gimmick is that it can copy the ability of any Pokemon flawlessly. He sings about world domination in the song, It Will All Be Mine. This is followed by a reprise of It Will All Be Mine, where he sends his grunts to capture Ash's Pikachu as he needs Mecha Mewtwo to learn its powerful electric attacks. While Ash and friends are in the forest, Brock's hormonalness causes him to chase after some cute girls while Misty reflects on how Ash seems to ignore her to focus on his Pokemon instead. Ash responds by singing about how much he cares about his friends. This is the song, My Best Friend. 
Meanwhile, with Ash's mom, Delia, and Professor Oak, they arrive at the lecture where Delia opens to Oak that she feels increasingly distant from her son. The professor responds by singing his big number, Everything Changes, which is a heartfelt song about growing up and how things don't often stay the same for long. He's gaslighting her. Speaking of things not staying the same for long, Oak and Delia are then kidnapped by several Team Rocket grunts and are taken to Team Rocket's headquarters, where Giovanni serenades the audience with a dark reprise of Everything Changes. The show then cuts back to Ash and friends, who are lost in the forest from before. Here they encounter a deaf trainer, and it is revealed that Brock is fluent in American Sign Language. The trainer offers to help the kids out in exchange for a Pokemon battle. I choose... J. P. Pink. Round. JP Pink Round, JP Pink Round, I choose Jigglypuff. Jigglypuff's main gimmick is singing a song that lulls those around it to sleep, and that gig is used here. Though Jigglypuff's song puts everyone to sleep, Joe the Deaf Trainer keeps his promise and his Jigglypuff draws a map on their faces. Misty wakes up shortly afterward, and while cleaning Jigglypuff's drawings off of Ash's face, sings Misty's song, a tune where she reveals that she has feelings for Ash that she refuses to speak about openly due to her fear of rejection. Meanwhile, with Jesse, James, and Meow, who also wore Lull to Sleep by Jigglypuff, they wake up in a pit, having fallen into their own trap earlier in this production. They all lament about their own incompetence. After all, by this point, they had tried to steal Ash's Pikachu throughout nearly every episode of the then-several-year-old anime series and failed. But Meow then cheers up his comrades by singing about how, yeah, they're failures, but it's something they're great at. This song is fittingly called The Best at Being the Worst and features Jesse and James doing a tango together. Act 1 ends with Ash, singing about how he will use his Pikachu to battle against the most powerful gym leader in the land to earn the Diamond Badge, remarking on his love for his shockingly powerful rat in the tune, Pikachu, I Choose You. However, while singing with his friends, Team Rocket sneaks up in a nearby lake and kidnaps Pikachu. The curtain falls on Ash, discovering that his little yellow companion is nowhere to be found. Pikachu! From here follows an intermission. This is partially filled by Ash's Pokedex, which is basically a virtual encyclopedia of Pokémon coming to life and explaining the important role he plays in Ash's adventure by collecting Pokémon data in the song What Kind of Pokémon Are You? This bit even features a little bit of audience participation, and Dexter is joined on stage by a group of dancers called the Dextettes. When the show proper returns for Act 2, Ash and his friends are still in the forest, where Ash has already deduced that Team Rocket has stolen his Pokémon. Misty, still upset about Ash often being oblivious to the feelings of those around him, claims that perhaps Pikachu left by himself due to seeing how Ash ignores his friends. Ash tearfully sings The Time Has Come, a goodbye song for his Pokémon. Meanwhile, at the Diamond Badge Gym, Delia and Professor Oak are forced to watch as Giovanni uses Mecha Mewtwo to further his plans. Here, one of the major twists in Pokemon canon is also revealed. Up to this point, Ash's father had never been brought to light, but here, it's revealed that Giovanni targeted her specifically because she was an old ex-girlfriend of his. According to writer Michael Slade, the implication was intended to be that Giovanni was Ash's father. As a teenager, I fell in with a bad crowd and there was this one boy. He started a gang that eventually became Team Rocket. The boy was Giovanni? Well, but I didn't stay with him long. I met Ash's father and I put all that behind me. Does Ash know? No, and he mustn't. Giovanni then comes in and gloats about his plans in a reprise of You and Me and Pokemon. At this moment, the grunts arrive with Ash's Pikachu in tow. Giovanni seems nearly unstoppable, and the grunts launch into a tune that later becomes associated with them, even in the animated series, Double Trouble. However, Pikachu refuses to battle Mecha Mewtwo, as it will only listen to Ash's commands. As such, Mecha Mewtwo is unable to learn its moves, so Giovanni orders his grunts to bring Ash to him, which they set off to do during a reprise of Double Trouble. Back in the forest, Ash has split from Misty and Brock to search for his rat. Brock realizes Misty has a crush on Ash and sings about his own love of women, specifically recurring anime series characters Officer Jenny and Nurse Joy. This song is Two Perfect Girls. Not far away in the forest, Ash starts a process of coping, singing about how, despite the memories, he may have to go on without Pikachu, even if it hurts. This leads to the song I've Got a Secret, which then leads to Ash and company meeting up along with his mom and Professor Oak, who managed to break free of Giovanni's clutches. Delia then tells Ash of her past with Giovanni, which enrages him and makes him resolve to take Team Rocket down. 
Jesse and James ride in on some very of the period Razor scooters to invite Ash to come with them to get his rat and try to take on Mecha Mew 2. Misty and Brock try to follow to support her friends, but are denied, with them saying that Giovanni specifically wanted only Ash himself. Meanwhile, his mother sings about how Ash has more reason to fight Giovanni than he could ever possibly think in another reprise of Everything Changes. Ash arrives at Team Rocket's headquarters and realizes that Giovanni is the gym leader from the Diamond Badge commercial. He even gives Ash the badge itself, gloating how he'll have reason to take it back soon. And Ash then engages Mecha Mewtwo in a battle, but Pikachu is easily dispatched and Mecha Mewtwo learns the final attack it needs. Ash still has fight left in him though, and tries to fight Giovanni himself in an old-fashioned fist fight. This is the song, You Just Can't Win. <laughs> Listen to me little boy, nice guy. The climax is Giovanni ordering Mecha Mewtwo to attack Ash directly and kill him. However, the original Mewtwo shows up and uses his own godlike powers to protect Ash from the attack. He then uses his psychic powers to show Mecha Mewtwo the goodness in Ash's heart, which results in it grabbing hold of Giovanni in anger and self-destructing. In the final scene, Ash, his mom, Professor Oak, and his friends escape from Team Rocket's lab. Ash tells his mother that no matter her past, she's still his mom and he loves her. And then he gives Misty the diamond badge as an apology for missing her birthday. As it is a fancy diamond after all. Everyone celebrates and the whole cast comes on stage to take a bow for the final song. Radio City Entertainment and Nintendo of America announced the first ever national theatrical tour of Pokemon Live a 90-minute live musical based on the number one kids entertainment property in the world. The multimedia live-action adventure premieres on the great stage at Radio City Music Hall beginning September 20, 2000, and then travels to theaters and arenas across North America. CBS Hey, 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 I got some special guests too. If you don't recognize these guys, these guys right here, you probably don't have kids. Pokemon characters are going to be spending a lot of time in the Big Apple. Take a peek at this. One tree, one tree, side by side, What's going on here? We're doing Pokemon Live at yeah. Radio City starting uh, Wednesday, September 20th through October 1st. It's going to be fabulous. Um, it's a great show. Everyone should come out and check it out. <laughs> now, uh, it's going to be all over the country. Tell me some all of the other we're cities. We're doing a 30 city yeah. tour. We're going to be in Toronto. We're going to be hopefully getting to Miami and Vegas later in the year, but we're doing Radio City for two weeks. So that's what we're gearing up for right now. There's always so many moving parts. I think the most complex challenge was when we went, on, went out on the road and you know we had designed everything for like a normal stage and a lot of the venues that we were in were like stadiums so being able to perform and communicate in like a hockey rink that holds like 10,000 people we didn't have 10,000 people but i mean you know it's like it, the spaces were massive i mean we were doing up to six shows a day right there were times at radio city where you would have a six show day and like I, it was that was crazy Maybe not, maybe we didn't do that, maybe we did four. It was too many, however many it was, it was too many, more than most. And again, it was like a real show, right? So it was a lot of work, it was a lot, a lot of work. In the height of our tour, we were doing, because it was a kid's show, we were doing four shows a weekend, or, or four shows sometimes a day. <laughs> uh, we'd have like six show weekends and we'd be exhausted. And then uh, Monday was usually a travel day. So we were like, yay, we don't have to do the show. We can rest our voices, but uh, you, you know, we need to, you know, that's not, you don't really relax too much on a travel day. Depending on your role, if you had all that makeup and stuff on, you didn't want to take it off and then put it back on again. So you'd just like stay inside, order food. You know, this is before like Seamless and Uber Eats, right? So like you'd have to call the deli, get them to deliver to the stage door at Radio City. And also, as in any production, uh, the stamina that it takes. Because I think on certain days, we had to do a full length musical three times. In, in New York, we had to do it four times a day. So there were Saturdays where you were doing this show, two and a half hour show, go, you, you've got like an hour in between. So you take a nap, whatever you can do. Uh, to re get focused again and then get back to it. Jennifer was Pikachu. Oh, this is my favorite story from Pokemon Live. <laughs> it's my absolute favorite. 
so there was like there's like always pyro and stuff you know during the show and i think one time you know jennifer's in her like pikachu costume and she can't really like see very much and Dominic would have to really guide her around the stage. I think there was like pyro in some city that either went off early or something. And it was like, it smelled like smoke. But you know, Pikachu was all, all of the Pikachu lines were track, right? It was all like Pikachu, that's all she says. Dominic was doing this scene with her where he was like, I, I don't I don't remember what the story was, but he was like talking to her about, some, talking to Pikachu about something. And Jennifer, <laughs> and he was like leaning in really close. So his mic picked up what she said. And because usually like if she talks, no one can hear her because she's not mic'd and we're in these like big arenas. So he's like acting near her and he's, and she goes, and she's from Texas. So she had this really thick like Southern accent. And so like he's talking to her and out of nowhere, Pikachu says, and everyone hears it, like, I'm on fire. There were moments, um, I think when we made our first trip after the two week run in New York, we went to Cleveland. Me and my, ro my roommate was Dom. Dominic Nolfi, we both ended up going to the Cleveland Clinic because we had, uh, we were feeling vocal issues. So we got scoped. It was just wear and tear. So we had to uh, perform, so we would perform the show, but then we would track our voices for for the songs for, for I think that, that opening uh, weekend in, or, or week in uh, Cleveland. I literally, in retrospect, <laughs> would have rather done like a snuff film or porn than <laughs> do this show. How do I say this, knowing that these guys are gonna maybe see this? There was like, there were elements of, it was definitely sold to these actors as like, like I was saying, like a real show, right? We're not doing Disney on Ice, we're doing like a real musical. And so, you know, some of these, <laughs> some of the people in the show took it really seriously, right? And they wanted it to be like their debut. And you're like, yeah, but buddy, like it's still Pokemon Live. I believe they were selling all this merchandise, you know, that, you know, they weren't selling at the tryout city. And big on the merchandise were these, well, they were sort of basically a version of the, of the Star Wars lightsabers <laughs> lit up and they had but they had like a flashlight at the end of them. And there was a number in the show that was done in black light and it, the magic of it worked because it's black light. And if, if you shine a flashlight on it, then suddenly the magic is over because you see the, the people in black. We immediately thought of that number as we're watching all, I mean, thousands of flashlights, giant flashlights circling the, the theater and we went over to one of the Radio City producers and said, these, these, these light things, these light things. He went, it's, isn't it amazing? You know how many of these are selling? Do you know how much money we're making off of every one we sell? And we just looked at each other and went, oh, okay. We just got what this is all about. And it is, it's better than it should be, to be honest. Like as a, as a show, it's better than it had any right being, but it was still Pokemon Live. So like, you had to like, you had to just do it. <laughs> like there's, you couldn't, yeah. I mean, you, you can't really complain about lights in the audience. Think you know your Pokemon? Meet Mecha Mewtwo, the most powerful Pokemon ever. What attacks does he have? All of them. See Mecha Mewtwo versus Mewtwo, plus Mew and dozens of your favorite Pokemon live in a rockin' on stage adventure. It's not just a game anymore, it's real life action. Get a free Mecha Mewtwo jumbo card with each ticket. Pokemon live at the Hummingbird Center. You haven't caught Pokemon till you catch him live. I was in Indianapolis, and it was like, ha it was in a, a, the State Farm Arena, and it was half of it was ice, and then half of it was like, literally where like they played hockey, and they put down like plyboard, and they put some chairs down, and then we did the show, and then backstage, they didn't put down plyboard, so there was just ice. It definitely gave me a, my first taste of doing a run of a show, and what that means and how you have to take care of your body. I injured myself uh, maybe five months in. I tore, because I was tumbling in the show and I tore my knee, the uh, lateral meniscus. And they had to bring in a replacement. But then I don't remember why I didn't leave the tour. I like stayed on the tour. I, I don't remember 
why they let that happen. But after like a couple of weeks, we like went back and forth splitting the role or something. Really weird. The best part about being Jesse and James is being bad. We get to be very bad. And, uh, and we get the cutest costumes. We do, we get the coolest costumes. Mm -hmm. I think by far we have the coolest hair in Pokemon line. Yes, definitely. I think so. But we, I mean, we get to, you know, sort of do all the mischievous stuff. Yes, that, we can get know, away with a lot. We can, we can. We get to play around and... We just get to play. Mm -hmm. The best part about being Jesse and James is that we just get to play. And I remember sitting on a speaker in that fucking wig and crying, being like, what have I done? What have I done? I don't remember exactly, but I feel like because I was on contract, they had to pay me. So they were like, well, just come and do what you can. And if you can, because I did it tumbling on at Radio City because it has a steel, Radio City, because of all the like moving parts of the stage, it has steel frames. And I just landed on one of the, you know, the wood that was like right on top of the steel and it just, my knee just split. And so I like, I finished the show and I actually did the next show too. And then I went to the doctor and they were like, stop doing shows. Pokemon Live is an all new stage show featuring your favorite characters from the Game Boy game and the television show. Have you ever wanted to see Ash Ketchum sing and Jigglypuff dance? This is your chance. The show started in New York City and is moving across the country. It could be in a town near you very soon. Nintendo Power, issue 138, November 2000. Who's everybody else's favorite Giovanni. trainer? Misty. Oh, Giovanni. Misty. I love Misty. Giovanni. Yeah. Um, I also understudied uh, Giovanni, and you know, I had, I looked nothing like the like Darren who played Giovanni, and so in the, <laughs> in the big number, there are two huge uh, projector screens, and so they had this whole like movie with. Uh, Darren as Giovanni um, kind of controlling everything uh, while he was doing his big song and also in the beginning. I think one time when I went on for him, they had to like cut it because it was so obvious that I was not him. I remember I made Abby crazy, like being like, I'm not doing this number today. I am doing this number today. She was like, "I, that's not how this works. You always remember like the big, uh, big technical issues. And one of them was, we we're in Detroit, I think, and the mic went out during Everything Changes, and then the music stopped. And so we we're like, oh gosh. And so we went back and started the song over, went out again. It went out four times in a row. And so we could hear people in the row saying, we can't hear you. I looked over and Dee just threw her hands up in the air, like, what are we gonna do? I don't even remember. I think they finally fixed it on the fourth time. It was this really strange, uh, balance between trying to do like a really great show and also it being Pokemon and like and playing like these great incredible arenas and then playing like a state fair like we were at <laughs> we played like maybe Indiana like the Indianapolis State Fairgrounds or something and it was like you know we were next to like the swine shack or whatever <laughs> like they also sold like little like light sticks so for me a big thing was when we're singing like everything changes with D, all the lights are dim. There's like a dance going on behind us and you see, you look out in the audience and you're like uh, seeing all these like glow sticks waving to you guys as you sing. And it was just, so that really, that's the, that's one of those moments that sticks with me for sure. You know, so you had to like take it in stride, you know, you had to like just focus on doing the best show you could do regardless of what was happening around you. Um, because that's what made it great. And you know, when you're doing, you know, eight to 12 shows a week, you know, you, it starts to, you start to get negative and you start to like, you know, <laughs> starts to wear on you and you sort of have to focus on doing the best that you can do at all times. My favorite, one of my favorite stories is uh, we're out on the road and Darren uh, gets a piece of fan mail saying, Giovanni, I loved you. Thank you so much for meeting. It was a meet and greet. Thank you so much for meeting me. You were awesome. And then it was a picture of me and the kid. And then I did leave before it ended because I went back to school and then Adam took over for the rest of the tour. It was like three or three months or so on the road. Uh, and then they were going to take it to Dubai, but they were going to cut it down. And I was, you know, I was anxious to get back to New York. I think I was like, because 
not to say that I was Pokemoned out, but I was I was ready to to get back and find a new show. Radio City Entertainment's Pokemon Live is looking for a few good Pokemon trainers. This live stage musical will appear at the Rosemont Theater in Rosemont from January 12th to the 21st, 2001. NTAC News, 5 January 2001. I found my scrapbook. I was like, this is my first show. Let me take some things. This is like a daily news. It's like real articles and things with like pictures that I took. So there was like a da random daily news article here with like a picture of Dennis dancing. And then this, I think that's from the Daily News. Uh, opening night, the opening night uh, invitation, opening night tickets. Uh, I think that some of the things that I remember are only because they're in this scrapbook. It's not like, I don't like actually remember them, you know? This is when I tore my knee. It's a, it was like a flyer from the doctor's office. <laughs> Adam came in, enter Adam. This was um, just dominant, being dominant. Oh, this is why I remember it was Indiana, because we were, because Indiana Beef Magazine in our dressing room. Here's a picture of us. Oh, this is a picture when they first got their Game Boys. Oh yeah, we had Thanksgiving on the road. I think we went to, we were in Atlanta, and I think we went to somebody's house. I think maybe Abby or Adam was from Atlanta. I think as far as learning the craft and learning how how a big multi-million dollar production goes uh, in a tour, I think that that was that invaluable experience. And every show that you get, you gain confidence. Uh, and so I think, you know, that was, in that sense, it could have been a vaulting point for a lot of us. But it was a really fun cast. I mean, a really young, fun cast. I'm still like really good friends with Dominic. Uh, and it, it was, yeah, it was, that made it all. I actually just worked with Dennis a month ago. He's like a stylist now and he styled the Broadway boys. So those people are all, and Tony is still a really good friend of mine. Those people are all uh, Abby to Adam. Um, so, it, you know, that, that made it fun. You know, everyone's sort of first show and we were just, it was like camp for all of us. Our goal today is to figure out what happened to Pokemon Live. Why did it fade into obscurity with no official recordings to be found? Well, to start, the final show from Pokemon Live's initial American tour would be on January 28th, 2001 in St. Paul, Minnesota. It would be the last of a tour of shows that stretched across the Eastern and Midwestern United States along with Ontario. I did Canada. I was, I did not make the, the tours uh, outside of like, you know, North America. So yeah, I did, we did Yay Canada. We, Toronto was great. We actually got a chance to see, um, not to get off topic too much, but we were there while uh, they were trying out Mamma Mia. So we got a chance to go and see Mamma Mia. Um, and, you know, while they were doing that there, and later on, we ended up meeting on the road and elsewhere, like all of the, <laughs> like the main three ladies uh, that were in, in Broadway, just randomly. However, this was not the full originally planned tour. Pokemon Live was supposed to go all over the United States, reaching locales from Texas to California. So what happened? Yeah, I, I know that it did not do as well financially as they everybody had hoped it would. I mean, I never saw the books. I don't know. I don't think it was a failure. I think it, I'm guessing that it probably broke even or if it didn't fully break even, then it served as 
a bit of a loss leader in in terms of the of the uh, the brand. Reports from the time indicate that Pokemon Live had consistent ticket sales. In fact, in January 2001, four kids had a Pokemon Live performance done in Chicago that was intended to be released on home video. I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> am not. Sorry. This is technically not the first return from you two. Many of you were lucky enough to catch Pokemon Live during its US tour last year and were blown away when Mewtwo made a surprise appearance. Oh, don't worry. If you didn't get a chance to see it live, it's coming to TV and home video later this year. Uh, there's a funny thing though. We, we took a day out, I think it was where we didn't have to travel, where we actually did a full length recording of the musical with like multiple cameras. I don't know what happened to that. It was in a vault and obviously it was like, oh, this is not what we thought it would be. So, you know, we'll just hold on to it. So what happened to Pokemon Live? Well, after the initial American tour, those at 4Kids regrouped, did some recasting, and got ready to send Pokemon Live to Dubai. There was a couple from the original cast that I think took it to Dubai. Um, and then probably, I don't know if they ended up doing the European tour as well. Not everybody's ready to go overseas. And also there were, they were shortening the show a little bit and they were also tightening, let's just say they were tightening up the salaries. The Dubai show was really odd in the grand scheme of things. This version was shortened down from an hour and 45 minutes long to just under an hour. It was done for only one weekend there as part of the Dubai shopping festival. This version sees not only the removal of nearly a third of the songs, but also the complete axing of both Delia and Professor Oak from the script, and with them, a lot of the musical's more emotional moments. There is a full Spanish version of the show that was performed for one day only in Mexico City in May 2001. This version is odd, both for featuring every single character in these character masks, which I've seen described as anywhere from uncanny to disturbing, and for also being the only version of the show to get an official video release of some sort. Though it wasn't released on DVD or VHS, this version of the show was aired on the channel Canal 9 on the 17th of August 2001. Indeed, some recorded versions do exist of it, and have since been released onto YouTube. There were also plans for European tours, especially in the UK. Indeed, UK tour dates were at one point planned for 2002, but these never panned out. We've had a lot of interest from Europe, and our plans are still pending. We did actually just have the show in Dubai, and now it's in Mexico, so we'll see where it heads next. We filmed it for at least on home video, but we may bring it out as a TV special. Nintendo Official Magazine, issue 101, February 2001. <laughs> Aside from two weekends worth of shows in Belgium and Portugal in 2002, that was it for Pokemon Live. Granted, some songs specifically written for Pokemon Live did make their way into following seasons of the Pokemon anime, along with the Totally Pokemon CD. Regardless, Pokemon Live never got another run, and never got a home video release, despite VHS tapes, DVD releases, and television airings being advertised on the official American Pokemon website after the tour wrapped up. While Pokemon Live never did get a home video release, there was an official soundtrack CD release. With that said, our research suggests this may have only been available at actual shows done throughout the American tour, along with a giant promotional Mecha Mewtwo Pokemon card. However, the existence of the tapes from the January 2001 recording are confirmed. After all, this wasn't a small, simple shoot. It was a full-on, multi-cam recording. Unfortunately, after 2002, news relating to Pokemon Live dried up and the general public just seemed to move on. Most people seem to forget about it. As far as North America goes, there are rumors about the tapes being in a vault somewhere and that some props have been left behind somewhere before the show moved overseas. That was until 2012, when former stage manager Chris Mitchell began uploading clips from the show onto his YouTube channel. This was accompanied by a full upload of a making of featurette that was produced during production of the show. Eventually, there was even an upload of a single cam VHS quality recording of the whole show. And Mitchell, for a while, seemed more than happy to answer questions about the show in his video comments. 
That was at least, until he mysteriously stopped in the late 2010s. But his comments still help provide a valuable look into the show itself. Indeed, he even talked extensively about the seemingly lost home video release. I spoke to the executive producer Norman J. Grossfield recently. He told me the story of the tapes. He had planned to edit the raw multi-camera HD video footage that was shot in Chicago into a final version, but he never got around to doing it. He left four kids and then four kids went bankrupt. The tapes that had been cozily stored at the four kids studio at West 23rd Street in New York City for many years were transferred to Pokemon USA in Bellevue, Washington, and are an archive now, never to see the light of day again. They have never been edited into a final version and most likely never will. As Nintendo is known to keep long-standing archives of data and materials relating to their properties, it's likely the footage still exists. So why not release the footage? Pokemon is the best-selling media franchise of all time. Did the show do poorly enough that this seems infeasible? Impractical? It's probably more likely that they just haven't felt a need to pull the tapes out yet, even though the show actually apparently made decent money. And there was minimal controversy surrounding it as well. Besides Andrew Rannells, who is openly gay, apparently detesting the character of James due to seeing him as a gay stereotype. I mean, James literally makes a don't ask, don't tell joke at one point during an early show. Well, right every on. character you play is, well, a has a little bit of, little bit of you. So This just happens to have a lot of, of us, us in it, I think. Yeah. Also of note is that 4K Media, the company that obtained 4Kids assets after they went bankrupt, is owned by Konami. Konami may also have some stake in some of the rights surrounding Pokemon Live itself, further complicating matters. This could definitely lead to issues if Nintendo or any of their related companies wanted to release the footage, even in an uncut form, as Konami also owns Yu-Gi-Oh, which, thanks to its own card game and popular anime series, is considered a competitor to Pokemon. So did any of the show's assets survive? Even some of the props? Mitchell certainly didn't think so when asked a few years back. The props were thrown away a long time ago. It's too expensive to store props that will never be used again. Mecha Mewtwo was probably saved and is in Japan at Pokemon International. In 2015, YouTuber Chadtronic made a video about Pokemon Live and the fact that it was basically a piece of lost media. His video caused a surge in interest for the musical, and even raised calls to release the HD recording from 2001. While this never managed to get the Chicago recording an official release, new info did begin to surface again, albeit slowly. Recordings of international shows, original scripts, and even, in 2018, abandoned props. This is from the YouTube channel Freaktography. It is shot inside the Tivoli Theatre in Hamilton, Ontario, a venue that has sat nearly abandoned for almost 20 years now. The Tivoli Theatre is like a Pokemon Live graveyard of sorts. Though the theatre was in a state of decay, there were dozens of props, costumes, and other items from Pokemon Live, which had been sitting inside since it was shut down. While some of the props have either been torn apart by vandals or have entered into some state of decay themselves, a lot of them appeared to be almost like new. The props didn't end up here during the original tour either. Toronto was the only original Canadian stop, and that was early on in the American tour. As far as our research shows, the most likely answer is that Hamilton, Ontario ended up having one of the final North American showings of Pokemon Live before the show was sent to Dubai, Europe, and Mexico. When Freaktography first posted their videos exploring the Tivoli Theater, they also shared photos across the internet, including on their website and on Reddit. And one of the electricians who worked on Pokemon Live recalled doing a show at the Tivoli, even though such a show does not appear on any lists of tour dates. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe these are props from the national tour of Pokemon Live, a stage arena musical that ran in 2000 to 2001. I was one of the electricians on the tour and recognized several of these props. The Pikachu have stirrups attached to them because a dream sequence in the show had actors dancing with several Pikachu and stirrups let the actors carry the weight of the prop on their forearms. Perhaps it was a one-off show, done to get one last bit of money before the show left North America. It's even possible that this may have been either a test showing or audition site handled by the Australian production company who did the international shows, having taken over from the American-based team in early 2001, though that, admittedly, is speculation. 
as of 2022, the props at the Tivoli Theater remain, and it's unknown if they will ever be taken away. So, what fully happened? Why did it basically become a piece of lost media? And could something like it ever happen again on stage? It was a video game first, but it was a huge TV show, you know? And so, like, if it didn't have that success, there's no way it would have would have been a stage show. And I don't, you don't really have anything that's that big and a part of, like, and also Pokemon was, like, a huge part of the American zeitgeist for, like, five years, you know? It was like the first of so many things, all these crossovers, all these games, the car, like it just became this huge thing. So it was it was more cultural than like a video game. You know, you could never do a Final Fantasy musical because like, who cares? You know? I'm sure it's somewhere, but I'm sure it's, you know, they, they're holding on to it. I don't know why <laughs> at this point. Um, just, I think it would be a cool thing to be able to like see, even if they put it up on some, some you know, Tubi or, or, you know, Netflix, whatever, just way in the archives somewhere. I think that would be cool to, at least for me to see it again. Be like, hey, I was, I was young once. I just would like a copy. <laughs> so what happened to Pokemon Live? Why did it fail? Why did it fall into obscurity? Well, there wasn't some big conspiracy or anything like that. Instead, as with many things, it all just came down to money. And why sink more time and money into a show that didn't make a lot of money to begin with? It was too expensive to run. The show was very popular, but they overdesigned and overproduced it, and it cost a lot of money to run on a day to day basis. It was a very expensive tour to run, and we were hemorrhaging money. The only logical thing to do was to scale the tour down, which was not possible or cancel the tour. The producers decided to cut their losses. 